My name is Tara and I'm a host experience manager with HipCamp. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're really excited to be here. Um, I'm also here with my colleagues, Mika and Kristen, and then also here with a very special guest, Ali, as well. Um, so you'll hear from all of them throughout the presentation. So I'll save the intros for them. Um, but to get started, our team actually attended Rally, the Land Trust Alliance Conference back in September. And we were blown away by the problems that land trusts were trying to solve and the work that they were doing. And we had some really meaningful conversations, built some really meaningful relationships, and we really wanted to keep that conversation going. So that's why we created this webinar specifically for land trusts. Um, and we're excited to share more information about HIP Camp with you today and to hear from you as well. So let me share my screen. And let me know when all of you can see this okay. Maybe like a thumbs up. Cool. Okay. So here's the agenda that we'll be going through. I'll give a quick introduction to HIP Camp. Um, Nika, our Senior Government and Community Relations Manager, will give you some examples of HIP Camp's impact on local communities. Um, and then, as I mentioned, we have a very special guest, Ali Stevenson from Midcoast Conservancy. Um, so you'll hear from her. Um, you'll learn more about Midcoast and then their experience as a HIP Camp host so far. So, to give you a bit of background on HIP Camp, we've been around for almost a decade now. Um, and the company was founded by our CEO, Alyssa Ravazio, um, and she was really frustrated with the state park system. So rec.gov was kind of the only option to use to book a campsite. Um, things were booking up immediately. The system was sometimes breaking down. It was just really frustrating to use. And even when she was able to get a camping reservation, she wasn't really sure what type of experience she was going to have. Um, she didn't know what amenities they would provide or what she needed to bring. So I'm sure we can all relate to that. Um, but that's really how Hip Camp was born. Um, and what we are, we're, we are a marketplace for tent and RV camping, glamping, cabins, and any type of unique outdoor stay. Um, and we connect private landowners with outdoor enthusiasts to open up new ways to get outside. And the primary value at HIP Camp is simply to leave it better. And our mission is to get more people outside. Um, and for me, myself, the reason I joined HIP Camp was because I felt so closely connected to the mission. Um, and I'm really happy to work for a company that really aligns well with my personal values. Um, for me, I love being in the outdoors. I love camping, hiking, being in the mountains. Um, that's where I feel most at peace. And I would say that my generation is very socially conscious. We care a lot about where our dollars are going and we wanna know that we're spending money on organizations that are really having a positive impact and making a difference in the world. Um, and Kristen will go into that a bit more, but for now I'll share a little bit more information about our community. Um, so as you can see here, our community is growing more and more each and every day um, and it encompasses a wide range of a wide range of outdoor enthusiasts. Um, so not just backpackers or really experienced campers, there's first time campers, um, there's glampers who are looking for a more comfortable stay. We really have a bit of everything. Um, and we have millions of acres of privately owned land. Um, Alyssa's dream is actually to become the largest private land network. Um, and with this land in our ecosystem, it remains protected. And then lastly, um, so we've helped people enjoy more than 6 million nights outside. Um, so nights outside is really how we measure our success at HIP Camp. Um, Eo Wilson has a book on biophilia, which means love of life and living things. Um, and humans are naturally connected to nature. So the more time we spend in nature, the more nights we get outside, the more we fall in love with it. And with that, I'll pass it off to our head of partnerships, Kristen. She'll talk a bit about her incredible work um, and some of the sustainability initiatives at HIPCAP. Yeah, thank you, Tara. So nice to have you all here today. Um, just to echo Tara's sentiments, we 
really, really loved um, the experience of getting to go to Rally. We learned so much from all of the land trusts that we had the opportunity to connect with. And I was really um, overjoyed to kind of see how many of the kind of goals that were both working toward align and overlap with one another. Um, you know, from, from where we sit, while we are a marketplace for outdoor stays, we really believe, as Tara alluded on her last slide, that if we can measure success based on how many people we can get outside under the stars, they will inherently take better care of the land. And we've really seen an uptick in engagement and overall people coming to Hip Camp because of some of these do good initiatives that Hip Camp is involved in. Um, as our head of partnerships, I get to work on really fun um, projects with the likes of REI, um, but I also get to focus on land stewardship partnerships. And so I'm working with right now the Smithsonian Institute, the E.O. Wilson Foundation, Xerces Society. Um, and we were the only for-profit organization invited to sit on stage at Half Earth Day in D.C. this year, where we really talked about, you know, nonprofit organizations are wonderful, but you're not going to get to this goal of protecting the entire world by ourselves. We all need to be in this together. And how can we think about bringing nonprofits with for-profits together and really aligning around our mission and values? And so um, Alyssa got on stage and she showed this amazing, um, you know, kind of map of where we have hip camps and the migratory path of butterflies. And everyone in the audience, she said, just got completely quiet because they realized that we have this incredibly powerful platform to reach millions of young people with this in really important data set, whether that's bird migration paths or butterfly migration paths or showing where there's conserved land, indigenous land. Um, and so now we have campers who are want wanting to see, like, where can I get outside that where I might be able to see like a, a you know, really beautiful warbler or you know, maybe catch a glimpse of a migratory monarch on its path from Mexico to California. And so one of the things that we have done is partnered with the Xerces Society, and they have helped us really build this program that has educated Hip Camp's hosts on how to create pollinator friendly gardens. So we essentially have introduced all of the native plants that a host might need so that they become these designated fuel stations for migratory monarchs. And we've just seen a really you know, quick and steep adoption rate amongst our host community. We have hip campers who've signed up to join the pledge um, so that they're being mindful of like what they're taking out on camping trips, you know, not purchasing Monsanto backed granola bars, but really thinking about how organic can we keep our community and, and con um, conservation minded. So um, more to come on this, but really excited to, um, you know, that this is such a huge part of, of what we are as an organization. Back to you, Tara. Awesome, thanks, Kristen. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about the logistics um, this will be sent over to you afterwards, so you can have a read through, um, but the main point I want to mention is that it's super easy to get set up. Um, we work with a lot of farmers and ranchers at Hip Camp who are completely new to hosting, they're not super tech savvy, um, and that's why we're here. So everyone will get paired up with an account manager, um, and then our support team is available seven days a week. So you'll actually have someone who you can call, which is really great. Um, you'll have help, someone help build the listing, walk you through everything, um, and then, like I said, be an account manager for you moving forward. Um, and you really don't need much to get started at all. We're not looking for you to develop your land in any way. That's not the goal. Um, it can be a very basic camping stay, pack in, pack out. Um, there's no running wa water required um, or anything like that. Um, and then another point I'll mention here is that we do provide all of our hosts with insurance for peace of mind. So overall, uh, Hip Camp connects people to nature in a way that really didn't exist before. Um, and it's really important for people to spend time in nature so that they know how to conserve it. Um, Hip Camp is really great for the local community as well. Campers spend on average around $300 per stay at local gear shops, grocery stores, restaurants, et cetera. Um, and landowners really partner with Hip Camp to offer low impact outdoor stays. 
um, as a result, they earn income based on the natural qualities of their land. And this income really helps landowners keep their land intact. It helps prevent subdivisions and sell-offs. Um, we hear from a lot of our hosts that it helps them fund passion projects like growing organic food or protecting natural habitats. Um, but most importantly, it keeps their land open. And with that, I will pass it off to our senior government and community relations manager, Mika. Um, she'll talk about some of her incredible work um, impacting legislation in different states, such as Colorado. So. Thanks. <clears throat> Hi, all. I'm Mika. I know we're talking a lot, so I'm going to keep this piece brief, but happy to answer questions about it now or personally one on one. <clears throat> So my job is to work with counties and states that are interested in creating opportunities for private land uh, camping across the U.S. and help change or edit current laws to make this use accessible to landowners. So Chafee County, Colorado is a place that just passed the first of its kind policy in the country um, to allow for private land camping. Um, and that's really exciting. So their ordinance is called commercial camping on private land. It's different from running a commercial campground, which is often a primary use on a property, requires a lot of development of that property in terms of electricity and bathrooms and water and things like that. Um, this is specifically for agriculture and agritourism uh, land users, and it's secondary or incidental to that primary land use, and so it doesn't require a ton of development of the property. So it's really accessible to folks whose land is already under um, some kind of conservation easement. So uh, the requirements of this regulation is that you be an agritourism or agriculture-based land use as your primary use. You have at least five acres, and if that's the case, you could have up to 10 tents or RV or van camping sites on your property, depending on your acreage. Um, and all you have to do is apply for administrative permits and make sure you're doing things like, you know, respecting wildlife migrations on your property and being fire safe, things like that. So we were able to create this process that essentially allows farmers and ranchers and ag landowners to go from having to essentially wait over 18 months and pay maybe $20,000 to go through a very confusing permit process to being able to walk into the administrative office of the county and apply for a permit, you know, pay maybe $150 in fees and be able to host this kind of land use. Um, and we had a ton of support from the community. They requested us to come help them with this. So we worked with the Chafee County Economic Development Corporation, which is similar to a, a Chamber of Commerce here. Um, the Colorado Cattlemen's Agricultural Land Trust was really supportive. Um, the Cattlemen's Association out here, the Colorado Land Link, which is an organization that exists to help young and new farmers get into land ownership and rental so they can farm as well. And then farmers and ranchers of all sizes across the county also helped us work on the details. So because of this new permit, there are about 250 parcels just in Chafee County that will be able to make use of this land use if they want to. Um, and it's a really great way for some of these folks who are land rich, cash poor, to develop a secondary revenue stream on their property to allow them to continue investing in that property long term, while also still providing that conservation ethic um, and investment on their land. So really excited to see so many land trusts interested in this land use. And I know that individual um, legal agreements and conservation easements can be quite confusing, but we are here as the government and community relations team to support you and try to figure out how to make this work if it's of interest to you. All right. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Ali Stevenson of Midcoast Conservancy based at, out of Maine. Um, Ali and I had the pleasure of getting connected earlier this year. I was still pretty new to hip camp and had I didn't really know much about land trusts at all, to be honest with everyone here. And Ali was so gracious in, um, you know, kind of getting me up to speed on some of the biggest pain points that um, land trusts face, how hip camp has really been um, a valuable partner in her organization's success. And 
Um, we've just continued to see the Mid Coast Conservancy do such wonderful things with, with hip camp. So um, I'd love to um, do a bit of Q&A with you, Ali. Thank you so, so much for being here. Um, I thought we could... I thought we could start out by having you just share with the group a little bit about your um, just the journey around having campers at all, like pre hip camp, but just, you know, how long has Mid Coast been doing that? And, and um, can you tell us a little bit about that experience? Sure. Um, yeah. Hidden Valley Nature Center is um, a thousand acre um, preserve that Mid Coast Conservancy has. We are the product of a merger about six or seven years ago of three land trust water um, protection organizations and and Hidden Valley and now have added a, a fifth land trust to the to the mix. And Hidden Valley Nature Center was um, sort of the the gem that we were really excited about because it um, it had been put together over the course of 25 years by a couple who um, and who had started building these cabins and things on the land. And um, so it's it's a wonderful place for people to go camping because it's super easy. It's none of the cabins is more than about a two mile hike in, and, and a lot of times it's on sort of fairly easy logging roads and stuff. And yet it's it's not far from the main stream of well, such such as it is in Mid Coast Maine. <laughs> it's not very Maine anything, um, M A I N. Um, but um, we the rental process went from being on a Google calendar to then we, we had a, when we redid our website, we had a different booking platform. I'll go ahead and name it bookie, which was just um, not working for us because every time anybody did anything um, made reservation, if they wanted to make any change, cancellation, anything, they had to call or email me and the staff hours that started to add up in terms of what it took to um, to make a reservation happen were cutting into any potential money we were making off of the whole the whole venture and um, and that was that was incredibly frustrating but particularly because our model out there is kind of a self, a self-serve thing. We don't we don't go in between stays or whatever. People just leave it the way they found it, or maybe even cleaner. And we've had really really good luck with that. But suddenly our booking process was becoming super high maintenance and taking away from what it was was dreamed of being a, a pretty smooth process. Um, and so thankfully uh, <laughs> we found Hip Camp. And I as I, as I said to these guys. You know, every time someone makes a reservation or a cancellation or a change to the reservation, I get a little message on my cell phone and I and I just look at it and I think, huh, I didn't have to do anything. It just happened all by itself. Um, so that's been dreamy um, in terms of how um, self-sufficient people can be in the process of making their their reservations in a way that was absolutely not possible on our former platform. That's great to hear. So it sounds like you had a, a few people managing the kind of campers and you were able to just downsize that to one and do it all out of pocket completely and i mean i wouldn't even say i mean i i guess technically i i <laughs> i am so one person is helping out but i almost have never have to do anything i mean it's just been really really straightforward and the support's been fantastic too not to sound like an advertisement or anything but and <laughs> great no, we are proud of our support team. They do a lot of the heavy lifting there, um, especially with people getting on site and like maybe needing to just connect with someone about like, where's the gate or how do I find this? Um, can you talk a little bit about like maintenance of the of the grounds and the land? You mentioned like people bring, they, they're like coming in and leaving, like pack in, pack out. So um, how does that work? Yeah, I mean, the, the cabins themselves are very, you know, super rustic. And what you, what is there is the only thing we promise is going to be there is um, a tea kettle on the wood stove, <laughs> and they all have a fire ring outside. And but people have to. We have a parking lot, and people have to pack in from the parking lot. There are no motorized vehicles on the preserve at all, um, and so they bring in anything they need. We did put a pump in about a year or two ago, and that's been really nice because people have a water source now. Before that, they had to bring in their own water too. Now they just need to bring their own water vessels. Um, 
And yeah, and then people, there are no locks, no check-in or anything. It's just go in, do your thing, and then be out by, you know, noon and the next folks can come in at one. And um, and we even tell people if they want to come early and just dump their stuff, we've got kind of a big barn in the center of the preserve and they can just dump their stuff and go play and then come back and get it or whatever. But it's just all super, you know, on the honor system. We're just assuming everybody's going to leave things nicely. And I, I mean, honestly, I can think of maybe three times in the past, you know, seven years that I've heard from somebody that something wasn't there or somebody left. Sometimes people leave their trash thinking that they're being really helpful and leaving you kindling for the wood stove, but <laughs> that's just a nice way of not having to carry out your trash, I think. Yeah, that's actually really um, a nice thing to, I think, double click on, which is just like the type of people that find you through Hip Camp. Can you just talk a little bit about the community? Like, what have you seen from the folks coming to the, the um, conservancy and maybe just a little bit about what that mix of folks looks like? Yeah, I mean, I, I certainly will. Um, I mean, it's it has before we were on hip camp, we, you know, we, we had a fairly diverse group of people, but I would say it was more localized. I think one of the things that's been great about hip camp is that, um, we're reaching people farther out, like Portland is uh, about an hour away. And there are a lot of, you know, it's a, it's a young city and there's young families there and it's a great family camping experience because again, it's pretty darned easy. Um, uh, once and once you're there, you feel like you're in the middle of nowhere because um, you sort of are. Um, but I, I think one of the things that I love about the way that the hip camp has helped us is is I've heard from people that they were trying to book somewhere else and it was booked, but then it offered them some other places nearby, which included us. And that's how they came to us. And so it certainly is expanding our reach that way. But I also I, I think just the simplicity of the booking system. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're definitely hearing from people coming from much farther afield. Um, and I, cause I think they're just hearing about it more because, because the, the presentation of the information and their ability to access it has been much improved. Yeah, I actually, um, I connected with a friend that I worked with a long time ago who lives in Bangor, Maine. Mm -hmm. And he, he said, Oh, I love hip camp. I found this one spot. And we realized that it was mid coast. Oh, so we are talking about his experience and he said, you know, I, I would do anything to make sure nothing ever happens to this place. Like, I hope that they stay online and, you know, like, are there things that the community can be doing to, to make sure that they remain on, on hip camp or at least just remain bookable and continue welcoming guests. And I think that really speaks to that kind of point we made earlier about getting people outside in nature just inspires them to want to take better care of a space. They want to come back to it. They want to bring their kids there. Um, I, I met a host in um, Index, Washington, and there was a family there and I, I said, what's your experience been like hip camping? And the couple said, well, we we started coming here before we had kids. And the kids were, you know, like six and three, which I thought was really sweet. So it's become this like family tradition that where they just keep coming back. So um, that's really great to hear. Just Well, and, I, and just to, to be piggyback on what you said, we we so often hear people saying, thank you for making something like this possible, you know, available. And, and we've got, you know, we've got a, a boardwalk that goes out into a kettle hole bog on our property and people, you know, th th when they start exploring the area around, there's no question, but it's stimulating a sense of stewardship and a desire to protect. And, you know, and certainly in our case, it's also helping us spread the word about our other 54 preserves, but, um, but I, there's no question that spending time like that, out in the middle of nowhere, you know, falling asleep to owls and, and the sound of the lake water, whatever is, you know, it, it stimulates something in people that keeps them coming back, but also they, they see what it's doing with their kids too. And I, that's been so powerful. The, the number of people that have just said like, this has been transformative for our kids and, and come back regularly. And yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah. And I think, you know, a common, and maybe you can speak to this, but what would your advice be to anyone here or who's listening that like, they don't have cabins and they don't have um, a current like host setup process today, but they're thinking about it. You know, what would your advice be there? Um, 
because I think a, a concern for a lot of folks is like, well, we don't want people coming onto our land and destroying it or, you know, like messing with nature or um, disrupting local habitat. What you just said makes me feel like, well, people come though, and they, they suddenly fall in love with the space and they want to take care of it. So what would your advice maybe be for someone who's thinking about this? Yeah. I mean, I, I it is definitely a weirdly self-selecting group of people. I don't think that it tends to be people that want to come and party and trash the place because they're, you know, they're people that have chosen to come to this place because presumably they want to be someplace beautiful and remote and, and keep it that way. I mean, we do have, we have two campsites at Hidden Valley. We also have a a campsite out on an island in Damariscotta Lake, which is a pack in, pack, pack out everything. Um, and, um, you know, that seems to be the one that would be the, the ripest to, to get abused because it's in the middle of a, of a lake that's very popular in the summer and it has a rope swing then people come during the day and whatever and it, again it's just there's kind of a you know people people want to take care of a place that's given them a lot of joy um you know the the campsite option is certainly the most straightforward and and our our campsites on a spectacle island are you know are a good example or, or the ones at the nature center of how easy it is to just start start small and light the footprint is super small with the with the campsites you know we we do provide firewood to people and we have a fire ring and we just you know that way we ask them to keep the fire you know in where in a controlled place or whatever and um and i i just i, I sometimes think that the self service thing almost guilts people into being really good <laughs> stewards you know like who wants to be that jerk that took advantage of a situation where somebody said hey come be in our space you know for for free or for not very much money um and uh so it, it's it, it's a risk worth taking because i really do feel like the the, the folks that that come are there because they really want to be there because they want to take care of it so they can come back yeah yeah so well said um I'm curious, maybe this is my last question, and then we'd love to open it up for Q&A, but can you talk a bit about if, if you have um, in, like reinvested in the land or has HipCamp been able to help you kind of, you know, enhance the Conservancy's initiatives, anything there that you might want to call out? Well, I, I definitely would say that the that the money that's coming in as a result of the camping is much more completely being reinvested into the work that we're doing and improving the facilities. We've we've taken three of our cabins and been able to insulate them with some of the funds that we're generating out there to make winter camping a little more comfortable for people that don't think it's fun to freeze. Um, and, um, but and in large part, that is because, I mean, we're, we're certainly getting more campers, but we're also spending way less staff dollars on, on doing anything. And that's, so it's been a win-win in, in both senses there that um, it's not taking so much of my time and other people's time. And um, and is been really easy for people to to do, and so the the easier it is, the more likely people are to, you know, I used to get calls, oh, I can't figure out how to do this, you know, on our old site, and you know, and then or if they, you know, how how many people didn't call because they just said screw it, I'm not going to do this, and so instead they get they make the booking because it's easy. Yeah, that's great. I know it's funny that you mentioned calling because I think going back to Tara's earlier point, like. I, I think it's kind of amazing that, you know, there's this technology, right? I think of like your millennial or Gen Zer, which is the majority of our community. We have, um, I think 75% of the people who come to hip camp are under the age of 55. And all of these people are scrolling through their phones all day, right? They're reading the news, they're on Instagram, TikTok. Um, why not put an app there that lets them touch hip camp and suddenly they're connected with nature, right? I think my experience in Terra's and most of ours of going to rec.gov is so painful, um, you know, and like fighting for camp inventory is a real struggle too, where you're like leaving work early, try to lock down a site. It's like that BLM land that can get really trashy and overcrowded because I don't think people are as respectful and so we just see like a total shift with people loving the convenience of being able to connect and discover wild places. And then just seeing that um, full circle of like how they take care of it. It's what's kept us growing. So um, 
Thank you so much, Ali. I'm going to open it up. I'm sure you'll, you'll have many opportunities now to, to speak with people asking questions. Um, I have seen a few come through in the chat, which sounds like the um, just uh, questions around the government and community response to um, to having camping on, on land. Um, Pete uh, asked how local government has responded to this. I think this meaning like hip camp and having people camp on land um, with zoning ordinances maybe pro being prohibitive. Mika, do you want to just speak to that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question, Pete. So oftentimes codes have been written, land use codes, and they haven't been updated in like 10 to 20 years. So uh, what I have seen in most counties in the U.S. is that there may be a commercial campground regulation, which requires more built development, and there may be a short-term rental regulation, which requires usually a single-family home or an ADU, but this kind of land use is often not discussed in the code at all, um, and so land use landowners have to default to something like a conditional use permit or something similar, which requires many rounds of public comment, hearings, planning and zoning commission meetings, uh, votes by the board of supervisors, something like that. So my job is to go into counties where we have potential hosts or local governments who are interested in pursuing this land use and help them specifically write drafts where of the code that they can insert into the land use code as written. Um, and that requires some process and takes some time. But generally we found local governments really open to this land use, as long as they can regulate it safely and um, protect like neighborhood and conservation values. I think most of the concerns we see from local governments who aren't super familiar with this kind of code is concerns around fire safety and neighborhood feel. So they wanna make sure you know, neighbors aren't being exposed to loud, rowdy campers in a residential area. And they wanna make sure that anybody who's doing camping on private lands is being fire safe and not dumping waste in a field. Um, and so we have model legislation that I can share with you if you wanna approach your local government or I can come with you to a meeting. And I can also do work to um, read through your local government's code and then figure out where and how this might fit into existing uses. So I'm here to partner with you to think through this for your local community and to advise you or potentially partner with you on how to make this work for you and your uh, community. And then I see a question in the chat, what's the cost to land trusts to use HipCamp? And uh, I will kick that back to Kristen. Yeah, actually, um, maybe Ali, if you want to speak a little bit to what what this has looked like for you all, I'm I'm assuming Carla, when you say cost, are you, are you just thinking of like bottom line, like how much does Midcoast spend, like each year toward maintaining Hip Camp? Uh, is it okay if I speak? Yeah, of course. Everyone, okay. <laughs> everyone's welcome to come off mute and ask questions. By the way. Okay, yeah, I'm just curious what the cost was um, when they were managing it themselves versus uh, when they used HipCamp. Um, like, was the, did the cost go up using HipCamp, but it was an easier platform to use? Or did the cost go down using Hip, HipCamp and the platform was easier as well? For us, the cost went up a little bit, um, but again, uh, you know, put against the staff costs that were going, the time that our, our old platform was taking, it was negligible. And um, and we did raise, our we're, our prices are, are very reasonable. And we did, partly because we also offer our members a 40% discount. So we have to, <laughs> so we have to make it enough that that even at 40 percent it's it's break even for us but we did raise the prices a little bit and nobody batted an eye and so the the very small incremental raise and in the cost that we put in covered the the 10 percent that hip camp gets of the reservation so um i would say that it definitely didn't cost it didn't cost us anything, even though it costs more. And it definitely is actually costing us less because we're just not having to, we're not having to do anything anymore. So it was a worthwhile change in in cost. 
and Nick Carla also oh, oh go ahead I was just going to add um, that on the hip camp side in terms of fees and cost to set up it's completely free to lift with us um, the one thing to be aware of is that we take a 10% commission off of the bookings we send you, and then you keep 90%. Um, and what that 10% goes towards exactly is credit card fees, which is how you get paid, insurance. Um, so we provide all of our hosts with liability insurance up to 1 million per incident. Um, and then it goes towards marketing and support as well. And I will say that the, having the credit card part built in, you know, we, that was another headache for us. And that's been so seamless now. So, and the insurance is huge as well. I mean, that's, that could be really expensive to get on your own. Pete, looks like you have a question. How are hip campers vetted? So we, go ahead, Terry. <laughs> I'll let you answer this one. Okay, awesome. Um, so we have a review system which works on both sides of the platform. Um, so campers review hosts and then hosts review campers. Um, so when campers sign up for Hip Camp, they'll put in all of their information. Um, and then if they have taken a stay before, a host is able to see the reviews on that camper. Um, there's also the option to set your listing up as request to book. So campers can't just automatically book your spot, they'll put in a request. And then during that time, you can ask them a series of questions, find out who they're bringing. Um, and then if you feel comfortable, you can accept it. And if not, you can decline. There's no penalty if you decline any booking request. Any other questions? Can I just add to the answer for Pete too? I will say one of the nice things about Hip Camp, and I've worked at a handful of companies, and this is the only place I've ever seen do this, is that we have eyes on every host review for a camper that doesn't that isn't positive. So if somebody submits a review on a specific camper that comes back negative, we have staff who see those within 24 to 48 hours, and we just remove those folks from the platform. So I will say there's a ton of accountability, both for hosts and campers on Hip Camp, because we are manually looking at every single review that's negative. And so that's something that landowners I've worked with have found a lot of um, trust in is that like, people don't mistreat properties. And if they do, the first time we will just remove them from the platform and insurance will cover the damages. Yeah. Great point, Nika. Anyone else? Can we help with camp design? Yeah, we, we can. We, we tend to let our hosts kind of uh, own the whole experience, but we definitely, um, just to call out an example, like something I'm piloting right now with REI is a world where hosts can um, receive gear from REI and um, we'll make that gear available to campers. You know, so if Carla, you said, we're going to probably get a bunch of people here that don't really know, like they're not prepared. We hear this from hosts uh, occasionally where like, if there isn't a structure for a person to sleep in, they might show up with like a tent that hasn't even been opened yet, or, um, you know, they're, they're missing some of that stuff. And so those are the types of things that we could work with you on. Like if you wanted to have something like that handy, or even just like a what to pack checklist to share with campers before they come. Um, so those are all things that, that we, we have um, resources to work with you on as you get your camp set up. Which also makes me think that one of the things that we we've learned, you know, as we've been doing this is that the more information you put on your listing, the better, you know, that you can't be too thorough in terms of preparing people for what they're going to be uh, finding or not finding. And um, because there's nothing that will frustrate people more than than thinking that there's going to be something, you know, and, and we, you know, we've had a couple of people back in the day who were like, oh, I didn't realize it, you know, and when you get a question like, so are linens provided, you know, you're like, okay, but apparently you didn't read all the way down <laughs> to the part where you're going to be sleeping on a wooden platform. Um, and you probably want to bring a sleeping pad and your linens. Um, 
so uh, we, you know, we just, we're always kind of throwing in something else if somebody asks us about something, but um, you know, that you're going to have a much higher level of satisfaction from a camper who was fully prepared to, to understand what they were going to be um, finding when they got there. Yeah, such a good point. And I, we, you definitely, Carla, can just have self-contained camping vehicles and no tent camping. We have a lot of hosts who are strictly RV or camp, kind of camper van focused. Um, some of our hosts only have glamp setups. They just want to create that like kind of more premium experience for people that want to get outside. So you really can create a mix. Um, and, you know, I think the, the difference at the end of the day ends up also coming down to how much you charge per site. So some land trusts that we've talked to, one in particular in California that's going to be going live um, they don't really care about the money. They just want to create a way for people to find their land trust and come stay on it. There's really no easy way to do that today unless you, like Ali said, call a phone number and try to get a hold of someone. And most people these days, millennials and Gen Zers especially, don't like picking up the phone and having to talk to someone. They just want it to be automated and have that kind of set for them. So I think it's um, you know worth calling calling that out, but definitely, really up to you how you get your camp set up. Um, I know we have just two minutes left. I wanted to ask one question of Mika, um, which is around public health and toilets, uh, because we haven't talked about that. And I just want to, you know, while there's really not a lot that land trusts need to do to get their land set up for campers, public health is something that we care very much about. And so just maybe voicing over what we generally recommend um, we do there for like to have the bare minimum uh, set up for a camper. Yeah, so we require all hosts through hip camp to have some kind of bathroom option for campers, unless they're only allowing self-contained RVs with their own bathroom system. So lots of landowners choose to do something depending on the climate like a pit toilet or a compost toilet option if they want to go um, you know, more rustic. Um, and if they already have a bathroom hookup, sometimes folks will just attach something to their existing septic system and build something a little fancier. Um, but you know, we have hosts who do all kinds of screened bathroom options. And that's definitely something we can advise on, especially for land trusts where um, additional septic system hookups may be disallowed given a conservation easement agreement. So um, we do require bathroom uses. And I think there's a lots of interesting ways that landowners have made that work with minimal expense. Thanks, Mika. We might have time for one more question. All right, so no questions. You all are going to be becoming hosts. We'll see you all hosting on Hip Camp by uh, peak season of next year. Um, everyone, thank you so, so much for being with us today. We really appreciate your time. Allie, thank you so much. Um, it's been so My nice. Pleasure. And if anyone wants to reach out to me directly with any questions, I'm super happy. I'm just Allie, A-L-I at midcoastconservancy.org and always happy to do a one-on-one -on -one conversation with somebody. Thanks, Sally. Maybe we'll include that in just our, our recap to the group. We'll include a link to this webinar. Feel free to share this with folks within your orgs, people you know. We'll include Ali as well. And yes, please stay in touch if there's any open questions we can answer after today's webinar. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye. Bye.